Hello and in this video we'll be looking at the analytical techniques part of the AS Chem 2 module. This is by far one of the easier topics there is, so you really should not be dropping any marks on this in the exam. Typically there's probably only around 7 to 8 marks on it in any ways and they are fairly straightforward to pick up. So I'm going to start with the, the IR topic rather than the mass spec purely because I've drawn these out and I want to rub them off in a minute. Apologies if the lines aren't straight and you are particularly OCD and crying at your screen now because of it but I have just tried to hand scribble these down since the camera wasn't working particularly well trying to fill in the whiteboard over there. So the way an IR spectrum work is every bond it has a particular frequency at which it vibrates at. So in future if you do go on to the chemistry more then you will start looking like a demented chicken in a rave where your teacher will probably get you to start flapping about and showing all sorts of the different rotations. With that, whenever you shine light at it, then it will absorb the energy of the light which relates to the frequency at which the bond is vibrating. And in terms of that, it can be related to a wave number. So you'll probably not go into the physics of it, but energy equals Planck times wave number. So you will usually see it in terms of a transmittance. It can be flipped and just shown as absorbance, in which case everything points up. So what it means is here, all of the light actually got through. So transmittance is high, sort of 90 odd percent. Whereas here, as you can see, the frequency of this, it matched a particular bond. So the bond absorbed all of the light, well, the majority of the light which hit it in that region and caused the bond just to vibrate a bit more. So the detector would notice that not all of the light at that wave number was getting through. And obviously you get a peak because of that. It is a bit odd, they are called peaks despite being troughs as well, by the way. Another just a little irregularity in it. Now the main point what you'll have to do with the IR is actually just identifying compounds which have came from an IR spectrum. So you do get a data book in the exam for this, so don't sit there trying to memorise all the numbers. And it is just a case of looking at the table, looking at the peaks on here and matching up where they come from. So I've quickly scribbled down four of them and as you can see we've got four compounds over here. And it's just a case of matching up the compound to the actual spectra. So we'll work through how you could do that. So look at this spectra first. We've got a nice strong sharp peak here around the, the 1650 region. Again apologies if it looks a little bit off. That's what it was meant to be. This is characteristic of a C double O bond, the carbonyl, like that. So what you would do is you would look across your compounds here and see which of one of them actually has that bond. So does A have a C double bond O? No. B? No. C? Yes. D? No. So the only option there which could match up to this spectra is compound C fairly straightforward. Now across here we don't really have any characteristic peaks. This is just a CH bond. It's not far enough along and it's not really big enough to represent an OH bond as we'll see. So there is nothing there. There's no C double bond C, there's no C double bond O, there's no OH bonds, anything like that. So there's no real functional groups in there. So an OH bond, not there. C double bond O, not there. C double bond C, not there. So the only option we've got is compound A. Now across here, you'll see this. This is nice and characteristic of an OH bond. It's a really big, broad peak up this end. Depending on if it's a carboxylic acid or an alcohol, will change the, the actual value slightly in terms of being a bit to the right or higher up but an OH bond is very easy to spot. So there's nothing else in there that's worthwhile noticing. So we've used up C, we've used up A, B, no OH bond there, so it must be compound D. And finally this one, obviously by powers of deduction you can work out what it is now, but we'll just go through how to check. 
So there's no OH bond, again that's probably just some CHs. There's no C double bond no. This does look to be in roughly the same region. The C double bond C is just a little bit lower, but you'll notice the actual size of it as well. The carbonyl group is very big, very sharp typically, whereas the C double bond C, quite small, a bit harder to actually make out. So compound B there. Now in terms of these peaks being big, broad or actually narrow like that, it does link into how much energy they're actually absorbing. So remember the equation what I just said before, the E equals Planck wave number. You'll notice the energy is higher up here what it's being absorbed. And with it also being much broader, it means it's absorbing more energy. So something to blow your mind. The OH bond in water is actually far worse as a greenhouse gas than, say, the C double bond O in carbon dioxide. Yes, think of that next time you hear all the news reports. Um, not much else really to do on IR. When you're answering questions, though, be very co com comparative. Got my English model up there. They do normally have two marks. So say if I showed you this spectra and this spectra and said which belongs to compound C. You would say that compound C has a C double bond O. So state the actual bond you look at. And it is in this region. This spectra has that peak in that region. So the 1650 to 1680. This spectra does not have any peak in that region. So it's a bit wordy, but get it across. State what bond you are looking at and what region it should be in. It's more or less a for IR. Now the mass spec continues a little bit from what you did in Chem 1. So you should be able to remember the actual processes, what happens in terms of vaporization, ionization, acceleration, deflection, detection. So you'll have your typical graph like that. The only other things what you need to be able to do in this topic is just being able to identify the peaks again. So the base peak is the tallest one. And the molecular ion is the one furthest up. Now the molecular ion, if you're asked to define it, it's just the ion which has the same M over Z as the M of the original compound. Because you're only knocking one electron out of it. An electron's mass is negligible. So in terms of mass divided by your plus one charge, it should still equal your M of the actual compound. Be careful though, you may sometimes see a very small peak just to the right of it. Ignore that. Because with this, you're looking at the carbon 12 isotope. So carbon 12 has exactly 12 by definition. Up here, a little bit further along, it may just be to do with the carbon 13 isotope. If you're looking at quite a big compound, then you could have quite a few carbon 13s, and you might actually see a little peak there. Just ignore it though. So the mass spec, in terms of what it's useful for, they are very accurate. So if you look at MRs of compounds, say if you just did it to uh, no decimal places or one decimal place, some compounds could have the same MR. However, a good mass spec can measure to five decimal places. So oxygen isn't 16 like you see on your periodic table. Because of the isotopes with it, 
it will be like 15.9945 whatever whatever after that so two compounds which may have the same mr to one decimal place to five decimal places they would start separating out so a mass spec can tell the difference between them so that's what a mass spec is useful for something i forgot to mention with the ir there just to link back into so very messy but just to get a point Below sort of the 1000 region, you'll notice on a lot of spectra, it basically just looks like a mess. This is called the fingerprint region. So the fingerprint region is unique to every compound. So just like your fingerprint is pretty much unique to yourself, then did all the compounds. What it's useful for is if you've got two compounds which are quite similar, say butan 1 all and butan 2 all, then they would both have the OH peak. So not like that, as I said, it's just a mess. But they both have the OH peak, similar length of carbon, similar amount of CH bonds, so they'd be quite difficult to distinguish for you by eye. So what you can do is actually overlay the spectra and get an instrument or machine to actually look at the fingerprint regions and compare it to, say, a known standard. So if you want to know, is your sample butan one all or butan 2 all? then you get the spectra of butan 1 all, overlay yours with it. If it matches exactly, it is that exact compound. If it doesn't, it's not. Simple as that. Um, another thing what the IR is useful for is pick it up impurities. Say if you're converting an alcohol to an aldehyde, then if you want to check if it's been done properly, obviously you should have lost your OH peak and just have C double bond O's now. If you've still got an OH, then you either haven't converted all of the alcohols or you perhaps say went too far and converted to a carboxylic acid. So IR is quite useful as just a, a quick check over to see if you've what functional groups you've actually got. And that is it for analytical techniques.